silence is the enemy. Let praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety. Let it rise. Let praise arise. Come on, sing it out. We sing your name in the dark and it changes everything. We sing with all we are and we claim your victory. Let it rise. Let praise arise. Here we go. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. For fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our Welcome you to Crossroads this morning. We're so glad that you're here. Crossroads exists to love God, love people, and make disciples of Jesus. If this is your first time here, um, there should be a blue U card on your chair or near it. Um, go ahead and fill that out for us. We're looking for any way to get you connected here. After you fill that out, there's a treasure chest in the back, or you can take it to Crossroads Central, and the people there will get you connected. You can go ahead and turn your attention to the screens for some more announcements. Hey guys, Pastor Jeremy here with the announcements. 
Coming up on April 14th, we have the Rise and Build Dinner. It's an exciting day at Crossroads with the new building coming, and we want to tell you guys all about it. We need you to register on the Crossroads app and register if you need child care. There's a suggested donation of $30 per plate to help us cover the cost of food, but don't let that stop you from coming. If you can't afford the $30, register anyway. If you have a teenager, you're gonna wanna sign them up for Crossroads Youth Camp. This year camp is August 13th through the 16th at the Sunstream Retreat Center in Ogden, Iowa. The cost is $300 with a $50 deposit, but we never want finances to be the reason why a student can't go to camp. So if you need scholarship help, just reach out and we'll make sure to contact you. We can hardly believe it, but Easter is only two weeks away. We want to make sure that if you have kids from birth through fifth grade, that you check them into Crossroads Kids because we have extra special surprises for them that Easter Sunday that will point them towards Jesus. Service times are 9 and 1030. We'll see you there. Now let's get ready for worship. You know, this next song is an exciting one. If you would stand with us as we continue in worship this morning, this next one, the reason we started singing it, honestly, oftentimes I, you really shouldn't pick songs because they speak to you as a worship pastor, but this one really does speak to me. I don't know about you guys, but there are some days, some weeks where I just feel like I'm getting bombarded. And I just don't feel like I'm good enough. But the beauty of the gospel is the fact that Jesus Christ came and died and rose again because we are not, and that's okay. You just need to surrender it to him. Surrender the lies, surrender the doubts, and just trust that God is gonna be faithful to carry you through it all. Come on, let's rejoice together, come on. Tries to steal what you save, saying, I have no reason to praise. I will give thanks. Come on, would you give thanks with me? I will give thanks. No matter where you are this morning, come on, lift it up. When the roar that I hear is the voice of my fear, trying to silence this hope in my heart, I will give thanks. I will give thanks. A song of thanksgiving is my battle cry. With joy as my weapon, I'll stand and defy. The lie of the dark with my hands lifted to the sky. I will rejoice. I will rejoice. I will dance in your kindness and claim Strength. And I'll never stop 
Sing, you give life. You give life. And you are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. And great.
guys can all have a seat. All right, so this moment of generosity, let me, I'm going to give you a little philosophy and a little bit of scripture combined as, as we're thinking about things. Let me read the scripture for you first. In Mark chapter 12, verse 41 to 44, it says, And he sat down opposite of the treasury and watched people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums. And a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. And he called the dis disciples to him and said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contribute out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty has put in everything she had to live on. So this is a really powerful teaching moment that Jesus has with his disciples. And, you know, they're measuring different amounts and seeing like, man, which one's more? And it seems really obvious. And Jesus talks about the sacrificial principle of the widow that, that gave like, in a faithful way, like this is what she had to live on this week. And she gave it to the ministry and it was a wild, wild aspect of generosity. So the, the thing that is interesting about like giving is it's, it's directly related to our hearts. The Bible talks about this a lot, like where our, where our hearts are, like the modern version of this is look at your bank statement and you'll see where your heart is. And that's not a, it's not a bad thing. Like I, my heart is with my family. And so, you know, part of my finances every week or every month is I make a mortgage payment because I want to provide shelter for my family. Um, I have to keep feeding these kids every week. So we have to buy food all the time, right? That bill is always coming, like water and utilities and all those kinds of things. So like that kind of shows you like, yeah, that's important to us to provide a nice life for our family, give shelter. And if you've got hobbies, you'll see it in your bank statement there. And so our heart and our finances, they're, they're linked. It, it's, it's easy to say something with our mouth, but if you look at the bank statement or the credit card statement or however you spend your money, it's just really obvious there. Like what's, what's a priority to you uh, or to your family? And I think about this abundance principle and the sacrificial principle. And I look at like what I know about what the modern church has, has expressed for the last 50 or 60 years. I don't know if you know this or not, but for the last like half of a century, 20% uh, of the church, this isn't a crossroads thing, this is a global church thing. 20% uh, of the church will do 80% of the giving. 20% of the church will do 80% of the serving. When really like when we look at how the Bible teaches, the role of the pastor and elders and, and church leadership, it's not really for us to do all of the things. There's obviously really important roles that we give to staff. And, uh, you know, we expect a lot out of our team and they work really hard and they love what they do. And so there's no doubt they carry high levels of responsibility. But did you know in Ephesians chapter four, the role of the, the pastor or the pastors or the elders, it's actually to equip the saints, which means you, by the way, you're like, oh, I don't know, know if I like that title. Well, that's what the Bible calls it, to equip the saints for what? The work of the ministry. So actually the leadership's job is to empower you, give you the skills, give you the tools, and to encourage you and inspire you to go out there and change the world for the sake of Christ. And so that's, there's this really interesting, like 20% does 80? Well, that's not the way the Bible talks about it. The Bible talks about like, it should be like 100% does the 100%. We're to be like all in together. And, and then there's this uh, like really cool concept that falls on the heels. Like if everyone does like a little, then no one ever has to do a lot. That's, that's really the way it was like designed, whether it's finances or if it's serving or uh, loving on people, like there should never have to be one or you know, a few people doing the majority of the work. It's supposed to be like, evenly spread and there's different giftings right some people are gifted in business and some people are gifted in pastoral care and some people have abundance in finance and some have lack some of you have like man big emotional bandwidths and you can have people to your house over and over again and you have hospitality for days and some of you are like maybe once a month that's all i can handle but the reality is if we all are all in god uses our eclectic little groupings and giftings and all the different ways that he's blessed us and this community forms. And then as new people come into the community, they're blessed by it. And then we train them up and they become a blessing to others. And it's just this perpetual cycle. So don't raise your hand or answer audibly or anything like that. But which one are you? Are you in the 20 providing for the 80? Or are 
are you a part of the 80 that maybe does nothing or very little? Let's pray about that and ask God to speak to your heart directly on this issue. Just ask God, what would you have me do with my time, my talent, and my treasure this week? And listen to him as we pray. See what he says to you. Let's pray together. All right, well, welcome back to week four. Maybe for some of you, welcome. Uh, this might be your first one in the series. And so essentially what we're doing is we're teaching through the Easter story. But I started uh, in, in the teens. We started at Matthew 16, and we talked a little bit about, like, what are some of the big picture things that are happening? So Jesus, we see all different aspects of his ministry in each of the four Gospels. And the thing that we saw towards the end of Matthew is he's really kind of setting up, like, the big picture, like framework ideas that are going on. And some of those are things like his divinity, his, his, his God nature, that he's, he looks like a man, but he's trying to explain to them. And the gospel of John talks about this in even greater depth than the gospel of Matthew, that Jesus is not just a teacher. He's not just a rabbi. He's just not a really a talented guy. Like we see him doing different miracles. And even in their day, even in the first century, the leaders are trying to discredit him and explain them away. We see that all the way back even into the Exodus story and, and, and Moses is called to be the herald for the people, the, for the Israelites. And he's doing these miracles. And even back then, Pharaoh's like, oh, yeah, yeah. well, I got guys who could do that too. And so from, from the very beginning of God's story, even into this present point, uh, there's folks that are trying to discredit Jesus and say, that's not that big of a deal. And I don't think he really walked on water. Maybe there were like sea turtles that were under his feet. He was floating. I mean, there's all kinds of kooky stuff they'll throw out there but what we're seeing is he's saying look i'm actually god i i i'm him he, me and the father we're one like if you've seen me you've seen the father so he's, he's teaching them about his divinity then we see that he's preaching on forgiveness and how man we're to forgive one another and he's ultimately on his way to the cross where he's going to offer this great forgiveness for everyone. We're going to talk about that a little bit today as we study the Lord's Supper, uh, the very last supper that is, is recorded in the Bible. Like He's getting ready to offer forgiveness to humanity for their sins. So he starts teaching on this concept. Then we see that he is very persistent in calling people to repent. So we're going to... We're going to jump a little bit. We were in Matthew 16, 17, 18. We're going to jump really to like the passion story now. We're getting to like the real like meat and potatoes of Easter. And we're going to lead up until the actual, the death, the, the burial, the resurrection. But in the, in the chapters in between, if you're like, hey, I'd love to read more about this, um, I would say pick up on chapter 19, and they're, they're, not, they're not difficult reads at all, even if you're like, ah, I don't do a lot of reading. Uh, these are easy to read. He's going to teach several parables, uh, and, and all of them are going to kind of say the same thing. They're going to reinforce, like, man, it is time to get serious about repenting and putting your faith and trust in Christ because there is a judgment coming one day for those who are not in Christ. And so he's teaching this, like, Really heavy stuff. And so today, I want to point out a reoccurring theme, and then we're going to look at uh, the, the events leading up, the, the Passover events that are going to basically usher in the arrest and the betrayal and all this stuff. So one of the things we see, and if you're in a community group, uh, you'll be able to deep dive in these a touch more, but Jesus predicts his own death. This is not something that happens retroactively. It's not like he dies and the disciples have to scramble to, to fabricate some narrative. Jesus was really faithful to tell them, like, this is the mission that I'm on. I'm on a rescue mission, and it ends, by the way, with me going to the cross for the sins of humanity. There's multiple, but I'll read one for you today. It's in Matthew chapter 20, verse 17 through 19. It says, as Jesus was going to Jerusalem, 
he took the 12 disciples aside privately and he told them what was going to happen to him. Listen, he said, we're going to Jerusalem where the Son of Man, which is a title that Jesus would often use for himself, the Son of Man will be betrayed to the leading priest and the teachers of the religious law. They will sentence him to die. When they hand him over to the Romans to be mocked, flogged with a whip and crucified, but on the third day, he will be raised from the dead. So this is probably of all of them, this one probably contains like the most like robust explanation of his death. In fact, it's a pretty spot on prophecy that Jesus is giving of the exact events that are gonna get ready to unfold. I, I won't, won't deep dive too much for our purposes today, but one of the things that uh, you, you need to be aware about is how punishments like this would have been carried out. There was the, the nation of Israel that ultimately was governing their own people, the, the, the Jews, the, the Hebrews that were led out of captivity and, and they wandered in the wilderness. This people group had migrated from the Old Testament to the New Testament. They're still around and they're in two different camps, really. We've got the Northern Kingdom and the Southern Kingdom and there's a multitude of tribes that they're split into, but ultimately it's the people, it's God's people he's been protecting from the Old Testament. Now we see in the modern version of this, while we hear in Matthew chapter 20, is they're, they're still being governed by the same set of laws that they had always been governed by. If, if you're familiar with the Exodus story, they, we talked about it a little bit in this series where Moses goes up on the mountain, on Mount Sinai, and he communes with God, and God gives him the law. And that law governs their people for many, many years to come. And they're living by it. In fact, there's a term that uh, theologians, they say it's the Sinaitic covenant, that this covenant, that God, a covenant, anytime we see that word, think of it as a promise from God to his people. And so in this covenant that God makes with them, they're still living under this. And so there's governance that's actually happening um, from the Jewish leadership to the Jewish people. But at the same time, they're in an area, a province that's really governed politically by Rome. And so oftentimes the leaders will work together. This is a large group of people. One of the reasons we're going to see this in a couple weeks, but one of the reasons why these folks were such a threat to the Roman occupation, who's really like ruling things there, is they're way outnumbered. And so they've got, you know, the armor and they get the chariots and they get the swords and they've got the full weight of Rome behind them. But there's a lot of people here. So preventing like a social uprising is a big deal. They're trying to mitigate the emotions of the crowd. And so often you see the Roman leaders and the Jewish leaders working together. And we'll see this in the end where um, both different groups of leaders are kind of passing Jesus around because no one really wants to get their hands dirty with who's actually going to crucify him. So there's a bit of a, uh, they're, they're a little bit in like cahoots together and how they're going to carry this out. And Jesus is well aware of all of it. He predicts it uh, up front, and he's able to tell his disciples, like, look, this is what's going to happen to me. He's laid the groundwork. He's like, look, I'm, I'm divine. I'm going to die, though, but I'm going to be raised on the third day. And every time he shares something like this, in the beginning, if you remember, if you were here for the beginning, uh, Peter's like, nope, not on my watch. And then Jesus rebukes him. He's like, yeah, I'm, yes, this is going to happen, and there's a plan. And then we see in several of these that as he shares this, they, they're starting to understand that they're not supposed to fight Jesus on this anymore. And so it says oftentimes they were sad. Like this is their guy. This is their teacher. This is their, you know, as far as I understood it, this is their God. And they are really distressed from that. But not everybody seemed to be that worried by it. We, there's a man named Judas, and he's a monk. He's among the, the 12 disciples, right? We have several people following Jesus, but there's 12 that Jesus called out to follow himself even closer. He invests into them. And one of them is Judas Iscariot. Verse 14 in Matthew 26, one of the 12 disciples went to the leading priests. So this would have been like the, the Jewish leaders and asked, how much will you pay me to betray Jesus to you? Which is like such a yucky question here. And we don't know, like, it doesn't give us a lot of insight into his heart. Was it because he didn't believe in his divinity? Did he, did he not care? Was he so pressed for money he was willing to turn him over? Scholars have kind of debated for years about the motives, but all we know is that he went looking for a payday. How much will you pay me to betray Jesus to you? And they gave him 30 pieces of silver. From that time on, Judas began looking for an opportunity 
to betray Jesus. What a crummy, like, you know, you're, you're with God. So, by the way, he's not surprised. How many times, if you've read through the Gospels, you'll see multiple times Jesus will speak out loud someone's private thoughts. Like that puts a real damper on all your scheming and plans when you're hanging out with God and he answers a question that you didn't say out loud. He's aware of Judas and he's aware of his betrayal and he's aware of his heart. And so Jesus, though, we're going to see in this a little bit, he finally acknowledges the fact that, <clears throat> that Judas is the betrayer, but not yet. So I don't know how many times they had lunch together, how many times they had dinner together. We don't know how many people they ministered to, but they had done life together since this point, and, and Jesus doesn't even let on that he's aware of what's going on. In fact, well, if you read in John's gospel, uh, there's a moment before the Passover meal or during the Passover meal where Jesus actually washes the feet of all the disciples. Judas is among those guys. And so at one point, Jesus takes this humble position of a servant and washes the feet of these men as a way to demonstrate service to them and then tell them about their role on earth after he's gone. Like your role is to be to serve others. And so here he serves the very one who's going to betray him for money. Now, this isn't a small amount of money. Uh, if you can picture like a dime, this would have been a smaller piece of silver. Uh, a denarius is one of the, the denominations you'll read about in the New Testament. And that would have been about a day or two's wages for like a Roman soldier. So if you, if you equate that to what a modern soldier makes, I don't have any clue. I'd, I'd have to look it up. But my guess is like probably somewhere in the national average of fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 a year for a young man who's early in service. Uh, it would have been, you know, the equivalent of a day's wage for that. And then if you can think of like maybe the size of like a, a, a dollar, like a silver dollar, uh, this would have been more like, like 26, 27 pieces, like almost a month's wages. So when you're talking about like, man, like 30 of those, this would have been like a large sum of money. And so maybe it was just the sin of greed. We don't really know the heart of Judas, but we know, man, he agreed and he persisted to find them and say, hey, I know you guys are looking for this guy. I'll, I'll help you get him. What we, what, how much will you pay me? In other words, like, what is the price? What's it worth it to you for the head of the Savior of the world? And they, and they pony up the money. And then he's actively looking for an opportunity to betray Jesus. Some of you know what it's like to have someone in your close friend group that has betrayed you and how much that hurts. And, and, and what's really difficult is if you know someone is actively speaking ill against you, what's so, what's so what's just a terrible feeling is like often you're aware of it or you know about it or you can feel it, but you don't have it like concretely in a place to maybe like confront them or provide evidence or anything like that. I've noticed with people that are actively looking to deceive others or to hurt others, they're really good about saying, like, I'm, look, I'm just, I'm just asking clarifying questions. I'm not trying to, you know, be a bad friend or use of authority. I'm just, I'm just asking clarifying questions or, you know, you're crazy. I can't believe, I can't believe you don't, and sometimes they get angry and they kind of come at you and they, they, they make you feel like you're the bad guy for even considering, like, Man, Jesus, the, the book of Hebrews talks about this. He went through like the emotions that you and I went through. It's, it's this, this hypostatic unions, the, the fancy way the, the scholars say it. It's he's fully God. He's fully divine. He's perfect. He's sinless. He's God incarnate, which means he puts skin and, and bone on. It comes down to the planet. And he's fully man. So Jesus got to experience the full range of human emotions, which, by the way, he created. Like, it says that in the scriptures. He's there at creation. Like, it's created through him. And so all of these emotions and these feelings, and like, so Jesus knew what it was like to be hot and had to sweat. He knew what it was like to be cold. He, he knew the sense of loneliness. In fact, we see all throughout scripture, Jesus experiences real emotions. There's times where like, man, he is going to weep bitterly because of, of death and loss and, and betrayal. Like, there's a real, the heaviness of what's coming when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, it's like, it's super heavy. He experiences anxiety. All the emotions that we have that are very strong, Jesus totally understands. And this, this man who is like one of the guys who he, he's invested his life into is out there saying, hey, if you pay me enough money, I'll make sure you could get him killed. 
So there's times where like you and I experience stuff and we wonder like, God, do you even care? Like, do you even get me? Like, you're so, sometimes, uh, like, Holly will, will, will use terms like, man, he's the man upstairs. That's not what the Bible says. If, if you've surrendered your heart and your life to him, he's the man, he's the God that lives in your heart. Like, you, like, he is with you. He's for you. And when you experience pain like that, you've got a Savior who's like, oh, I know exactly what that feels like. And he's been there. He's experienced temptation. He's experienced all, all the range of human emotions. And right now, um, he's being betrayed by someone he is incredibly invested into. And it's Judas Iscariot. He'll come back on the scene. That's not the last we see of him. Now we shift to the Last Supper as we kind of walk through Matthew. After we know, Jesus, uh, we know Judas is looking for an opportunity to betray Jesus. But now we get to the Last Supper, which we'll read in chapter 17. It says, on the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, where do you want us to prepare the Passover meal for you? As you go into the city, he told them, you will see a certain man. <clears throat> Tell him, the teacher says, my time has come, and I will eat the Passover meal with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus told them and prepared the Passover meal there. Now, if you're, again, if you're in a community group, uh, the, what I, I wrote for the leaders to share with you this week is there's, there's a, a whole big background of understanding here, and I'll try to crash course you in like 30 seconds. In the Old Testament, you read about it in Exodus chapter 12. It's a fairly lengthy chapter, uh, but it'll give you a lot of background into uh, the original Passover. And so the, it, in a nutshell, what happens is as God's people are in captivity, in Egyptian captivity there, Moses is called to lead the charge, confront Pharaoh, say, hey, let my people go. And if you remember, it's, it's, it doesn't go well if you're familiar with the story. Uh, ultimately, the Pharaoh doesn't want to do that. It's his slave labor force. I've heard it estimated anywhere between two and four million people is how, how many Hebrews were there under their captivity. I don't know. I used to see the, I, I grew up watching the, uh, the Charlton Heston one. I think it's called King of Kings. There's an Easter one and there's another one. Uh, it's fantastic. And Charlton Heston is Moses. And, um, and I, it, it looked like 50,000 people, which is a lot of people. That's like what, the size of Dubuque? And so I remember thinking that like, man, that's a lot of people. 50,000 people parts the Red Sea. And it's, I mean, I thought it was a cool movie when I was a little kid. If you've never seen it, it's worth it. Uh, Newsflash, like CGI wasn't very good back then. So just deal with it. It's time period, like still a good story. It's a true story. So I remember thinking like, man, that's incredible to get like 50,000 people across the sea and out of captivity. And then I remember in Bible college, I'm studying like the nation. It's, it's hard to nail down. But at the time I was reading one scholar saying his estimate was that there were 4 million Hebrew people in captivity. That back then when I was reading that, that was like the size of the city of Houston. Any of you ever driven through Houston? You think Dubuque traffic is a nightmare at, you know, 5.30 p.m. Four million people. That's a miracle in and of itself, just to think about organizing four million people. But it's, it's a massive, massive amount of people. And, and in this, in this uh, chapter 12, you're going to learn that, like, man, the plagues that were happening were designed to be like a pain point so that Pharaoh would finally be like, okay, enough. Like, let's, yes, you guys can go. And the one that really tips the scales is the final one. It's the harshest one. God passes over their, their, their people and takes the life of the firstborn. And the whole idea was that they were going to have to uh, sprinkle the lamb's blood on the, on the doorpost. And he would, his spirit would just pass by and the firstborn would be saved. And so anyone that wasn't covered by the blood of the lamb... Right, we sing songs about that kind of stuff. And those that weren't covered by the blood of the lamb, their firstborn. The Bible actually says the animals too. So a bunch of animals would have died as well, uh, that, that they would be killed. And ultimately, you know, Pharaoh's own son suffers and is, is killed, is taken, and he, his grief is too much, and he, he releases them. And so this institutes something really special. In fact, it's quite specific. If you read the whole chapter, there's a lot of like details around like how to prepare the food and what you do with the food when uh, it's done. And like, man, it's, it's, it's really important. And, and God wants it to be like instituted like a national holiday to remember this Passover event where uh, the lamb's blood would have protected you. And I never 
it never made tons of sense to me. I mean, when I was a kid, I remember hearing that story, and it's like, you know, I, I think I was six or seven the first time I heard it. I'm like, so you got to kill an animal, which, you know, sounds really weird. And then you got to put its blood on the door. That's so strange to me. Until I understand later that it was like foreshadowing of what was going to come. See, Jesus is really close to being crucified on the cross. And the reason we celebrate communion, we take it every week here, the whole point of the, the juice is to depict and to draw your your heart, your attention to the fact that like Jesus' blood was spilled for your sins and for my sins. And there was no doorpost there, but there's blood running down the post of the cross. And it's Christ's blood that shed for all of humanity that if we're in Christ, the Bible says, that our sins are forgiven and they are covered and death is not something that we have to be afraid of. Now, in the, in the Old Testament, uh, it was a way to protect their physical life. But in the New Testament, the new covenant that Jesus talks about, he actually is protecting us from a spiritual death, which the Bible depicts as eternal separation from God. And so it's this really beautiful picture of like, you guys thought I did something special in the Old Testament. Where do you see this next one? I'm actually, and it's going to get extended to like Gentiles as well. So both Jews and Gentiles, God's originally like chosen people and then everyone to the ends of the earth, John like 3.16, all of the people that are in Christ are going to be covered under the blood of the lamb, the perfect lamb, Jesus, not just a spotless lamb that you pick out of your flock, but the son of God who came down here to live a sinless life, like his blood is going to be spilled out and because of that, everyone has access to the, the covering that Jesus offers. And so this Last Supper, they're having this Passover meal as they're honoring and they're remembering God's protection and provision for his people. Then he did something really cool. He says, you go to the city, you'll see a certain man. I don't know what that means. I guess they knew the guy when they saw him. And they said, tell him, the teacher says, my time has come. And they're going to eat the Passover meal at their house. So the guy obliged. He said, yep. Verse 20, when it was evening, Jesus sat down at the table with the 12. While they were eating, he said, I tell you the truth. One of you will betray me. So he's acknowledging the fact that he's aware of Judas's plan. And this, this gets everyone all riled up. Verse 22, greatly distressed, each one of them asked in turn, am I the one, Lord? So it's interesting, 11 of them were, were like genuinely worried that their heart that they knew was pure and they knew they were with Jesus and they knew they had allegiance to him and they would never betray them. They were greatly distressed because they didn't want to find out that it was them. Of course, one of them sitting at the table already knows the answer to this question. But he plays along. It's so ridiculous how sometimes people can't admit a lie. And so it says that each one asked, am I the one Lord? Judas is playing dumb. Verse 23 replied, one of you who has just eaten from the bowl with me, will betray me. For the Son of Man must die, as the Scriptures declared long ago. But how terrible it will be for the one who betrays him. It would be far better for that man if he had never been born. Judas, the one who would betray him, asked, Rabbi, am I the one? I don't know what he expected to hear at that point. Like, if, is he still testing Christ to know if he's all-knowing? Is he, is he hoping to like, if I just sound like the other guys, maybe they won't turn on me? I think that at some level, he's going to probably be fearing for his life, right? And we learned that at one point, Peter's got a sword and he's hacking ears off. So I think he knows like, this guy might be about violence if he understands that I'm the one. So I don't know why he's playing dumb, but he's playing dumb. And Jesus is really narrowing it down. He's like, hey, one of you. And then I don't know if he waited, it doesn't say. I don't know if he waited for Judas to like take his next bite. He's like, someone who just ate from the same bowl, like someone. And then Judas finally is like, I better, I better start speaking up. Is it, is it me, Rabbi, am I the one? And Jesus says, you have said it. So now he's identified at the table. Jesus says, you have said it. And I want you to see something here before I, I give you a first teaching point uh, this morning is Jesus said, just said a, a moment ago, it'd be far better if that man had never been born. Now, I bring that up because I had an atheist friend of mine I was ministering to back in Georgia, this is probably 10, 12 years ago, and I'm sharing the gospel with him. And I really love this dude, and I just desperately wanted him to fall in love with Jesus, and I wanted to be in heaven with him, and so I'm sharing the gospel with him. And so I asked him one day, I said, buddy, what do you think happens after 
you die. And I said, because here's, here's what I know to be true. Like, something exists forever. And it's either your worldview is correct, that you, you die and you're just unaware and you're dead forever. Uh, I, I, that's still eternity. Like, forever after this life, your life is going to be over. Um, I, I believe what the Bible teaches is true and that our, our soul lives on and that it's going to spend somewhere in eternity forever. What do you, what do you think is going to happen? He says, you know, the truth is, Matt, uh, I was not aware of my existence before I was born. And he goes, I don't think I was really aware until I was like three or four years old. And just all of a sudden you start having memories you can relate to. And uh, he goes, I think it's going to be like that again. I just think it'll be like before I was born. And that was really comforting to him. He's like, you know, it doesn't matter if I'm a good person or a bad person. It doesn't matter if I hurt people or if I'm good to people. Uh, he's like, I, you know, I hope people think I'm a good person. But it really all me. he's like, it does, he goes, I don't think it matters. I think it'll be like before I'm born. And Jesus says it's far better for that man if he had never been born. What he's recognizing and what he's confirming, and our, my first teaching point this morning is, Jesus confirms that we will all be quite aware of where we'll spend eternity. You're going to have consciousness of what's happening. Something that I've heard, it's usually guys who say this, but something I've heard men say a lot of times if you share the gospel with them and they're hardened to the idea of surrendering to Christ, I've heard them say, hey, you know what, I don't want to go there anyways because a lot of my friends are in hell and I'm going to join my friends there and we're going to have a party, which is radically inconsistent with what the Bible teaches that hell is going to be. It's going to be like a prison of eternal torment. So the Bible talks about the eternality of the soul. And, and one option is that you spend eternity with Jesus in paradise, and one is in eternal torment. So when the Passover happens originally in the Old Testament, I know this is probably kind of a heady or, or, or weighty message, but I really want you to understand like the foundations. What's happening at the cross is not an isolated incident. Jesus is fulfilling all of the Old Testament. The Old Testament is important. It's all leading up. It's all pointing to Jesus. And so I'm hoping to connect the dots for you today. Like, man, it was a big deal to save the lives of the firstborn. So much so that God is like, man, this is like a national holiday. We're going to celebrate it. And even Jesus and his disciples are excited about celebrating Passover. It's a big deal. But friends, let me tell you, it's a much bigger deal for Jesus to say, hey, this is not just about the firstborn. And this is not just about uh, me saving your physical life. This is about me protecting you and saving you for all eternity. So if you're in Christ, I will protect you and death will pass over. And for all eternity, you have salvation in me. This is like the beginning of the good news that is being preached about. He's going to protect them in this way. So he confirms that, listen, we'll be aware of where we spend eternity. Verse 26, as they were eating, Jesus took some of the bread and he blessed it. Then he broke it into pieces and he gave it to the disciples saying, take this and, and eat it for it's my body. And so Jesus is asking them to eat the bread. And he's using it symbolically to talk about my body that's going to be broken. That's why in our little, our communion cups, we've just got this little piece of cracker here as if uh, Jesus, to, to remember that Jesus broke the bread and he handed it out to the disciples that day. It's a big deal and they don't quite get it at the moment, but then he continues, verse 27, and he took a cup of wine and he gave thanks to God for it. And he gave it to them and said, each of you drink from it, for this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It's poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Mark my words, I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And we, we know in the New Testament that wine is a symbol for life. It's been, we usually can equate alcohol with uh, negative things because we have a culture that abuses it. And in the first century here, they would have equated wine to life. Oftentimes the water wasn't even fit to drink. They didn't have the filtration processes and they didn't understand uh, even like microbes and germs the way that we understand now. And so there'd be times where people would almost live off of wine because they would drink the water and they could get sick and they would die. It's a symbol for life. And so he blesses it and he likens it to his blood that's getting ready to be spilled out on the cross. Then they sang a hymn and they went out to the Mount of Olives. So my second point for you this morning is the Lord's Supper is a covenant from God to us that he will forgive our sins. Uh, it's one of the reasons we take, uh, we take communion here is just to help remind folks of like, what a great gospel message this is that we have. 
All right, last section, and then we'll, we'll wrap up after this. Peter, Peter's denial. And if you're not familiar with the story, maybe this is the first time you've read through this. It's like, wait, 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 I thought Judas was the bad guy. The good guy messes up too. On the way, remember, they're going to the Mount of Olives. On the way, Jesus told them, tonight, all of you will desert me. I mean, he's not full of a lot of good news on this evening, right? He's like, by the way, one of you who's eating right now, Judas, is going to betray me. I mean, like, this is a heavy Last Supper, they, you know, you've seen the, you know, the Renaissance painting of the Last Supper and they're all kind of reclining and, and chillaxing. And I don't know that that was the vibe going on in this day. Like, I think it was really heavy. They're having this like pretty intense ceremonial uh, dinner together. And then Jesus is like, man, there's a betrayal going on. And, and it, there, it's, a, it's a really rough evening. He's like, tonight all of you will desert me for the scriptures say God will strike uh, the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But I've been raised from the dead. But after I've been raised from the dead, I will go ahead of you to Galilee and I'll meet you there. I love this next line. Peter declared, even if everyone deserts you, I will never desert you. He's like uh, the total opposite side of the coin of Judas. He's like, that guy's a scumbag, and he, let him be a scumbag, but I'll never desert you. He's like, even if the rest of these chumps desert you, I'll be standing by your side. And I love that. Like in modern day, I think he would have tweeted that and it would have gotten retweeted. It would have been trending. It would have got a lot of likes because bold declarations, bold declarations like that, man, it can get some attention. I'm going to do great things. You know, I'll never fail you. Some of us have made bold declarations. This is the year I do my Bible reading plan. I'm not going to miss a day this year, God. Even when I'm sick, even on Saturday, even on vacation, I'm going to do my Bible reading plan. And now it's mid-March and how's your streak going, you know? <laughs> Jesus, this is the year I'm going to stop this sin. It's, I, I, I'm done with it. I'm going to put it to bed. I'm going to put it to rest. I'm going to turn to you and I'm never, I'm never going to mess up again. And then you fell right back into it. You know one of the reasons why baptism is important? Not only, there's a lot of sim symbolism there, right? Death, burial, resurrection. Uh, we're, we're, we're bar our, our sins are buried, we're raised to new life. A lot of symbolism there. You know why public profession of faith is so important? I want you to hear me on this because we'll do another one in a couple months if you missed the last one. But public profession of faith is important because there's no such thing as a secret Christian. It's an oxymoron. You can't be, you cannot have the God of heaven step out of heaven into your heart, radically change your life, and it never like manifest in a real way and be a secret. You are actually called, Acts chapter 2, this is how Peter leads. He's like, hey, those of you that need to repent, like, get up right now and go be baptized. Why? It's baptism, the symbol is important, right? Jesus says so, so that's important. It's, it's a command. But the reason why it's important for the church is so that you have declared your faith in Christ and there are witnesses, because it's a bold declaration to be baptized. It's not a declaration of perfection. It's not that I'm sinless. It's not that I'm ever going to mess up again. It's that you're aligning with Jesus and you're making a bold declaration. And none of us can do it alone, certainly without the power of the Holy Spirit living in us. And the church is there. We need to be in a church, in a biblical community. You guys know this to be true. Like all of us, not some of us, and if you haven't yet, you will. All of us are going to go through like incredibly difficult things in this life. And the seasons sometimes are long and we need people. Like there's days where like you're just going to feel lonely and you're going to need someone to be the hands and feet of Jesus in your life. And to say, like, I love you. Can I listen to you? How can I minister to you? Can I bless you? Can we feed you? There's stuff that, like, you're not going to have the answers. Like, some of you are parents, and, like, you're trying the best that you can. You feel like a failure over and over again. And you're going to have to, like, lean on other parents, and they're going to encourage you. And they're like, my kids are hard to raise, too. And you're like, I'm not alone. And then you kind of, like, you know, bond over the fact that no one knows what they're doing, and they're just trying to figure this out. And... Someone's loving on you. And the bold declaration is important because what you're doing is you're putting the church on notice. I'm one of you. I'm aligning with Jesus. Look, I'm not perfect, but I'm, I'm trying to follow him the best that I can. And our job is not to judge. It's to encourage, inspire, hold accountable, pick one another up when we're down. 
Bold declarations are important. So Peter has one. Even if everyone else deserts you. I just picture this. If his, he's like beating his chest while he's saying this. The Bible doesn't say this. I'm just, I'm just picturing I'll never desert you. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, Peter, this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny three times that you even knew me. Peter's got to be like, what are you talking about, man? You're making me look bad. I just told the boys I'm not going to be anything like Judas. I got your back. And now you're going to say three times? And he says, no, Peter insisted, even if I have to die with you. So he's dialing it up a notch. Even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. And the other's disciples bowed the same. Peter's a leader, friends. When Peter stepped up, the rest of them like, yeah, me too, me too. We'll die. They're all beating their chest. Bunch of young men, testosterone-filled 19, 21-year-olds. They're like, never. This will never happen. You know, and I, I think they believed it. I think they believed it. I think Peter meant it with his whole heart, the best he could in that moment. I think in that moment, he felt that resilience, like, I'll die to protect you. But of course, we learn later in the chapter, I'll read it next week, but Peter does indeed deny Jesus three times. And he's so grieved, I'm quoting the scripture, Peter is seen weeping bitterly. Some of you relate to Peter because you're like, man, I've made bold declarations too. And I meant them. Pastor, I'm telling you, when I made that declaration, I meant it with my whole heart. And I was ready to storm the gates of hell like you preached a few weeks ago. And then, like, I got cold and I got distracted and I got, I took a step back and I let other things come in. And then, and, and I don't, I'm not, I'm not there anymore. And I'm a failure and I screwed up again. And God can't love me anymore. Do you know how many times I've done this dance where I repent and I screw up and I repent and I screw up and like you've lived maybe months, maybe it's weeks, maybe for some of you it's years or decades and you've lived under like shame and guilt and you've allowed the lies of the enemy to tell you like you'll never be anything. I don't even know why. Don't make any more bold declarations. Some of you, because of that, you've had a pattern of, of failure and, and feeling like you're no good. You stop making bold declarations. This is what I see. This is, what, this is why it's important for the church to have young people. Hear, hear me, older people. I'm, I'm talking to myself as well. Hear me why this is important. Don't get offended. Just listen. Because when we're young, we're still sometimes just naive enough to trust God. That's why it's important to have young people in the church and then not just a church that grows older and older. Because I, I notice what happens when we get older. We start getting real careful. Because we start, we, like, we remember making mistakes when we were young and they were embarrassing and you don't want to make those again and we're supposed to have wisdom now and I don't want to, I don't want to look not wise and so a lot of times we just stay silent and I mean, there's a place for that too. But what I love about having young people is like they still have great measures of faith often. And yeah, they're going to make bold declarations and we know they're going to mess up and that's okay because you did too. And that God teaches us through that and refines us through that. But man, sometimes when we get older, we get too careful. Some of you have been too careful for far too long. You've been silent for far too long. You're still being haunted by the ghost of failure in your past 10, 20, 30 years ago. And you're like, I can't make any more bold declarations. I don't wanna, I don't wanna go through this again. I don't wanna weep bitterly again. I wanna have victory in my life. And this is how I'm gonna end the service. This is how I, how I wanna encourage you today. Because I think a lot of you here might really, I know I do, I relate to Peter here. And we read in John chapter 21, when Jesus reads, institutes Peter as a leader again, he tells him the same thing three different times, slightly different ways. But essentially like Peter is like, finally ready to return to Jesus again. Says that he jumps off the boat and into the water like a lunatic. and. When Jesus talks to him, he's like, hey, Peter, feed my sheep, feed my lambs. Hey, take care of my sheep. Translation, hey, dude, it's all good. Just get back in the game. It's time to go. It's time to serve people. It's time to minister to people. Stop being a part of the silent 80 and get a part of the act of 20. And when you're in the act of 20, I want you to recruit the silent 80 with you and let's go storm the gates of hell. Like, let's go, man. Go feed my sheep. 
That's what he says to him. And so my, my, but my encouragement to you today is the best place we could be when we screw up is running right back to Jesus. Stop believing the lies of the enemy that you're no good, that he'll never use you, that you've messed up. I got news, we've all messed up. We've all screwed up. And our God is gracious to extend grace to us and to offer forgiveness. And he restores people and he redeems people. But you gotta return again to him. He's not gonna do it while you're sitting on your hands. You gotta return to him. Would you bow your head and close your eyes as we kind of enter into a mode of prayer and get ready to worship together? Last week, I made a strong call for salvation. And that's always something that's offered. If you want to say yes to following Jesus today, uh, what I'm going to invite you to do in just a moment, the band's going to play. I'll be down at the right front corner of the room. And if you want to say yes to Jesus and you'd like some help, slide out during the final song. I'll be happy to lead you through that. But I want to pray for the church today in a slightly different way this week. Some of you are like, Pastor, I'm Peter. I'm Peter. I mess up over and over again, and I feel like I, I can't ever get it right, and I'm struggling with the fact that whether or not God loves me and it, or that he could use me. And I'm not even going to ask you to raise your hand. You know who you are. I want to pray for you, and then we're going to worship together. King Jesus, there's those all over the room and on our live stream that can relate to Peter today. And the enemy has done a great job of keeping them silent and taking their boldness away that they once had when they were younger. And my prayer for them is that they would run to you with reckless abandon the way we know Peter does when he's reinstated. Restore them, redeem them, deliver them, God. Make them useful for your kingdom once again. I ask all these things in Jesus Christ's name, amen. Let's stand and worship together. Merciful God, rain down your love, how gracious you are, that you sent your Son, you are holy. your love it runs so deep every breath you breathe in me you don't give up on me you don't give up on me and as long as my heart beats i know you will carry me you don't give up on me you don't give up on me you Beautiful. 
guys can have a seat for just a moment. I was just enjoying watching the band worship. Like, it feels so full today. I love all the voices, and we got all these folks up here leading. And I know Brandon would do it by himself if he had to, but you have more fun doing it with all these dudes, don't you? Yeah. We're, we're really blessed as a church to have such a awesome worship team leading us and hoping, hopefully not directing our heart and attention to them, but by putting it on Jesus. Hey, so we just studied this. We just read about this, and I hope you have an even fuller understanding. Jesus breaks the bread, and he passes it around. They eat it. And he's like, hey, this is my body. I'm getting ready. They don't get it yet. They're still fighting him on it. But, man, he's getting ready to go to the cross and have his body broke for them. We're commanded in Scripture to do this in remembrance of him. This is an act of worship. It's a, an ordinance of the church that we continue to do so that we, we remember his sacrifice. And then when he, when he does the wine, he actually gives thanks. So let's practice what we see Jesus doing. Uh, Lord Jesus, we love you. We give you thanks for your willingness to die. In the midst of the anxiety and the betrayal and all the strong range of emotions that you experience, you still completed the mission. And that's why we're here today worshiping you. So we give you thanks. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Would you eat with me? That second seal's a little bit harder on these new cups. Break it down, then pop it up. Would you drink with me? Man, it's been awesome worshiping with you guys. Favorite part of my week is spending Sunday mornings with you all. I hope that you have a blessed week. If you got a connection card and the blue U card, drop it in the treasure chest. Or even better, go to Crossroads Central. And, and we'll exchange it for a gift and you'll meet some cool people there. Say hi to some lovely people on your way out the door. Uh, you're dismissed. God bless.